Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. The Gospel reads as follows. After this, he, Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Every society adopts standards to which its citizens are compelled to conform. In their most formal and enforceable form, these standards become laws. No civilization could persist without them. One challenge faced by all societies, therefore, is in finding an acceptable balance between too little personal autonomy and too much. All societies have long navigated these waters, and the Jewish communities of the first century AD Roman Empire were no different. Now, most of the cultural norms of the Judaism of Jesus' time were rooted in the writings of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians today call the Bible's Old or First Testament. However, how those writings were interpreted into practical behavioral expectations was often a matter of considerable debate. Judaism of the first century AD was not monolithic. The Gospels themselves speak of differing Jewish sects, such as scribes, teachers of the law, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Herodians, for example. And history tells us that there were more than even that. And even within these larger groups, debate often erupted within them, as can be seen in the differing opinions of the rabbis Hillel and Shammai, both presumably Pharisees, upon which Jesus was called to give an opinion when he was questioned about divorce. Each of these groups, and even the subgroups within them, had a selection of unique interpretations of the requirements of the Mosaic Law. However, they did not disagree about every aspect of behavioral expectation. The Gospels seemed to indicate that at least two categories of behavior were considered unlawful by nearly all Jewish sects at that time. Maybe not the Herodians, since their group was more about whether they supported Herod's leadership over Israel or not. Maybe not them, but the rest seemed to be at least agreed on two things. Apparently, most believed that no upstanding Jewish person should have agreed to work with the Roman authorities as a tax collector, and that no upstanding Jewish person should have been living in intentional violation of the Ten Words, what Christians often today call the Ten Commandments. This latter group has been summarized by Luke with the term sinners. Jesus' call of a tax collector to become one of his disciples would have been scandalous enough at that time. However, to then attend a feast at said tax collector's house with other tax collectors and publicly known violators of the Ten Words in attendance was beyond comprehension for most Torah-observant Jewish people. Now, Jesus seems only to have come into conflict with the Jewish sect of the Sadducees when he was ministering in and around Jerusalem. And the Gospels record very few direct confrontations with the Herodians. Most of those who confronted Jesus about certain aspects of his teachings and behaviors were to be associated with groups associated with local synagogues, that is, scribes, teachers of the law, and the Pharisees. And that's not surprising. Of all the first century Jewish sects who lived and ministered within the Holy Land, These three were those who were most concerned about careful observance of the covenant of Sinai, and they spent a great deal of time considering and debating proper interpretations and behaviors. The Pharisees themselves traced their origins back to the teaching ministry of the biblical priest and scribe Ezra, and they were the forebears of what today is called the rabbinic tradition of Judaism. In terms of helping people to live in ways consistent with the teachings of God preserved in the Hebrew Bible, The scribes, the teachers of the law, and the Pharisees represented sincere and godly discipleship ministries. One of the reasons that they routinely got into arguments with Jesus is because many of Jesus' concerns dovetailed with their own, and consequently they were sincerely interested in him and in his ministry. 
A number of Pharisees, for instance, became followers of Jesus, including Nicodemus, possibly Joseph of Arimathea, and certainly the Apostle Paul. Even more, Luke has told us in Acts chapter 15, verse 5, that a number of the earliest believers in Jesus, who were part of the Christian churches of Jerusalem, still belonged at the same time to the sect of the Pharisees. Consequently, we must not make the mistake of presuming that Jesus' criticism of certain teachings and behaviors of some Pharisees represent a complete rejection of all that the sect taught and did. In fact, though Jesus occasionally critiqued certain of their interpretations of the Hebrew Bible, he more commonly criticized the Pharisees' failure to live as they taught others to live. For instance, in Jesus' most scathing critique of the Pharisees, which is preserved for us in Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 36, Jesus began by saying the following. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. Now I've provided this lengthy historical introduction out of a very practical concern. One way of interpreting Jesus' calling of Levi and of Jesus dining with tax collectors and sinners is to believe that Jesus no longer wished his followers to concern themselves with behavioral norms or expectations. To say it another way, we might come to understand Jesus as rejecting entirely the social, moral, and ethical norms of first century AD Judaism. That, however, would be a mistake. When Jesus was asked why he ate with tax collectors and sinners, his response was this, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus did not intonate that the moral or ethical requirements of God had changed, so that what were once considered sins are sins no more. He did not say that. Nor did Jesus suggest that overlooking transgressions was a more loving act than condemning sinful behaviors. What Jesus did say is that he was choosing to eat with those in rebellion against God because he wanted a personal opportunity to call them to repentance, that is, to change. When I hear Jesus' explanation today, it makes sense to me, and I often wonder why the Pharisees didn't see the logic of it at the time. But to defend them, the reason they did not do as Jesus was doing was more cultural than it was logical. According to the Covenant of Sinai, uncleanness could spread. As we discussed when we explored Jesus' cleansing of the man with leprosy, contagious diseases made people ceremonially unclean precisely because their disease could be passed on to others. Not staying in close physical proximity to one with a contagious disease is advised still today, especially if the disease has a chance of becoming life-threatening. The same uncleanness could be contracted by touching a dead body and for similar reasons. But of course, not all uncleanness in the covenant of Sinai was due to disease or the potential of physical contagions. Uncleanness could come from certain natural and recurring bodily functions. A woman's menstrual cycle would make her unclean for a period of time, for instance. A man's sexual emission could make him unclean. And any number of bodily discharges could make a person unclean. And we could go on. Some of these may be related to the possibility of contracting a contagious infection as well. However, the sacredness of blood, along with God's desire to keep sexual activity completely separate and distant from Israel's worship of him, likely also inform these stipulations. Furthermore, a more insidious type of uncleanness could come from disobedience to the covenant as well. And that sort of rebelliousness itself was treated as a contagion by the covenant of Sinai. When God first revealed himself to the people of Israel as a community on the foothills of Mount Sinai, the people were terrified by what they experienced. Exodus chapter 20 verses 18 to 21 has recounted the event in the following way. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, 
They were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has only come to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So Moses explained to Israel, that it was the fear of the Lord that would help them to live in submission to the covenant. And this principle has been encapsulated in the book of Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, which reads as follows. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. As Israel first learned at Sinai, to know God is to fear God. And even more, to fear God is the very beginning of choosing and acting wisely. In ancient Israel, The uncleanness of disobedience was cleansed in two ways, and they both were related to the fear of the Lord. If a violation of the covenant of Sinai was committed without malicious intent, what the Hebrew calls shagah, then it could be atoned for by sacrifice. On the other hand, if a violation of the covenant of Sinai was committed with malicious intent, what the Hebrew calls bayad ramah, or high-handedly, the sin could only be atoned for by the execution of the perpetrator. In the days of Jesus, Israel was no longer self-governing, so they were not free to be fully Torah observant. As we can see in the experience of Jesus himself, in those days Israel often had to receive permission from their Roman overseers to enact the death penalty. Now, there are occasions in the New Testament in which groups of Jewish people took matters into their own hands quite rashly, without any narrated penalty. But even on those occasions in history, the Romans would have had to investigate the matter and may not have agreed with their decisions. Due to this, folks often committed intentionally rebellious acts without consequence. What then was to be done with such people? The Israelites had learned to fear the Lord and by that fear, to obey him. I know it sounds like a poor motivation to us, but it is the motivation of the First Testament. And as Christians, we accept that really understanding who God is should increase the seriousness with which we treat our behavior. And that fear of the Lord was passed on to the community in the way that sinners were treated. So in one way, when a sin is committed without malicious intent, the sacrifices showed how serious the violation was. And on the other hand, if it was committed with malicious intent, then the execution was made to make the community fully aware of the seriousness of the the situation. But what happens if people commit intentionally rebellious acts and that consequence can't be put into practice because of the social situation in which they live. What's to be done with such people? Under the covenant of Sinai, they would have been executed. But under Roman rule, they continued to live amongst the people. The compromise suggested by many leaders at the time was what we might call today disfellowship. Dr. Grant Osborne, in his commentary, Luke verse by verse, has explained the situation as follows. In honor of his his life change, and to introduce Jesus to all his friends, Levi hosts a great banquet for Jesus at his house, which must have been quite large, as befits an important person in the community. Of course, all his former friends were fellow tax collectors and other sinners. We'll see this often in Luke, where table fellowship, sharing meals, a phenomenon we will see often in Luke, is both a focus for fellowship and a means of evangelism. This is why the Pharisees are so upset. In sharing a meal with such sinners, Jesus is both accepting and identifying with them. A maxim that illustrates this is, to share a meal is to share a life. Those you ate with became your circle of friends, and you shared everything with them. That's what's going on here. Levi is introducing them, not just to Jesus, but to the new life he has embraced. As said above, eating and drinking with sinners meant sharing in their practices and thus branded you as a sinner too. 
For Jesus, sinners were the focus of his ministry, and his purpose was to bring salvation to them. To the Pharisees, these people would tarnish not just their reputations, but their very relationship with God. The term Pharisee means a separated person, and they lived up to their name. Tax collectors, as we noted in chapter, in chapter 3, verse 12, were particularly despised because their greed and fraud were well known and their bad reputations well deserved. At the same time, the fact that they came so frequently to John and Jesus shows that many of them longed for a better life and wanted to get right with God. My guess is that there were quite a few converts from that group. To the Pharisees, they were doubly unclean and outcast, for they both broke the law regularly and constantly associated with Gentiles. There was hardly another group they despised more. His con quotation continues, Many have thought sinners to be not just a general description, but a specific group, the Am Haaretz, or people of the land, Jews who were not scrupulous about keeping the law. There's little evidence for this here, however, and it's more likely that these were people of low repute like gamblers and prostitutes, but certainly the sinners would include non-observant Jews here. Levi would have had many friends from these different walks of life. That's the end of the quotation. Does Jesus' behavior suggest that the Pharisees were completely wrong about the dangers of table fellowship with openly rebellious people? Well, the Apostle Paul did not seem to think so. He advised the churches of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 to 13 as follows. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral persons, not at all meaning the immoral of this world or the greedy and robbers or idolaters since you would then need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister who is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or robber. Do not even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging those outside? Is it not those who are inside that you are to judge? God will judge those outside. Drive out the wicked person from among you. In these verses, has Paul condemned the behavior of Jesus? No, he hasn't. In Paul's context, the meals that folks were sharing did connote full acceptance. Paul's concern was that by not disfellowshipping the individual in question, he would be led to the false conclusion that his sin had no effect, either with his relationship with God or with the Christian community. Jesus' situation was different. In fact, this was precisely what Jesus was trying to explain to the Pharisees who questioned him. Jesus did not accept an invitation to dine with Levi and his guests in order to enter into fellowship and relationship with them. Jesus insisted that his dining with them did not connote his acceptance of them. Quite to the contrary, Jesus explained to the Pharisees that he accepted the invitation to dine in order to confront them. In Jesus' words, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus, according to his own testimony, accepted Levi's invitation in order to call his guests to repentance. Bound up in this intention of Jesus are at least two truths that we must not overlook. First, Jesus did, in fact, consider Matthew's guests to be sinners. Jesus did not discard the Pharisees' assumptions about their behaviors and lifestyles, nor did Jesus suggest that because of his ministry their sinfulness no longer mattered to God. Jesus has not introduced a new set of behavioral norms, nor has he nullified the moral and ethical teachings of God delivered to Israel at Sinai. Jesus agreed with the Pharisees that Levi and his guests were indeed sinners. Second, Jesus considered those in attendance to be in need of repentance. As John the Baptist, whom God had sent to prepare the way before him, the heart of the gospel message of Jesus was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's difficult to know if there was an acceptable road of repentance a rebellious sinner might have taken to come back into good standing with God and with the community in the Judaism of Jesus' day. As I've indicated already, the most serious disfellowship was practiced with respect to those who would have been executed under the covenant of Sinai. For this reason, that covenant doesn't specify how to restore such people if they've not been executed 
but later become truly repentant. Perhaps there was a way for this to occur at the time, but the New Testament seems to suggest that if there were, it was certainly not a common practice. With that said, Israel had, throughout her history, rebelled against the stipulations of God's covenant, and God had not completely wiped out the nation. He had not executed them all. Instead, through his own acts of discipline, and through his speaking through many prophets, God had called the people of Israel to repent. And this was legal. The covenant of Sinai itself had contained this possibility. It can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 14, through chapter 30, verse 5, which reads as follows. I am making this covenant, sworn by an oath, not only with you who stand here with us today before the Lord our God, but also with those who are not here today with not here with us today. You know how we lived in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. You have seen their detestable things, the filthy idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold that were among them. It may be that there is among you a man or woman or family or tribe, whose heart is already turning away from the Lord our God to serve the gods of those nations. It may be that there is among you a root, sprouting poisonous and bitter growth. All who hear the words of this oath and bless themselves, thinking in their hearts, we are safe, even though we go our own stubborn ways, thus bringing disaster on moist and dry alike. The Lord will be unwilling to pardon them, for the Lord's anger and passion will smoke against them. All the curses written in this book will descend on them, and the Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. The Lord will single them out from all the tribes of Israel for calamity, in accordance with all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. The next generation, your children who rise up after you, as well as the foreigner who comes from a distant country, will see the devastation of that land and the afflictions with which the Lord has afflicted it. All its soil burned out by sulfur and salt, nothing planted, nothing sprouting, unable to support any vegetation, like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord destroyed in his fierce anger. They, and indeed all the nations, will wonder, Why has the Lord done thus to this land? What caused this great display of anger? They will conclude, It is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They turned and served other gods, worshipping them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against that land, bringing on it every curse written in this book. The Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, fury, and great wrath, and cast them into another land, as is now the case. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever, to observe all the words of this law. When all these things have happened to you, the blessings and the curses that I have set before you, if you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, and you and your children obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, just as I am commanding you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, gathering you again from all the peoples among whom the Lord your God has scattered you. Even if you are exiled to the ends of the world, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land that your ancestors possessed, and you will possess it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. Ironically, the Pharisees were the leading sect in this exact endeavor. They were leading the people into obeying the Lord with all their heart and soul by returning to full obedience to the covenant of Sinai, so that God might fulfill his promise and restore his blessings. They saw rebellious sinners as an obstacle to this goal, as a group of people who might cause God to refuse their repentance. And so they distanced themselves from them as if to say to the Lord, they're not of us. Do not judge us by their rebellions. We have cast them out. Do not tether our fates to theirs. It's not clear that Jesus would have disagreed fundamentally with this concern. However, Jesus' approach to the problem of rebellion was different. 
rather than trying to isolate the wicked and relocate them. Jesus sought to seek after these lost sheep and bring them back into the fold. The heart of Jesus was that all who had once followed God might return to following him. This is how Jesus explained his behavior to the Pharisees. He was not eating with them as an indication of acceptance or affirmation. He was eating with them with the intention of calling them back to relationship with God. The Pharisees had interpreted Moses' words as only for those who wanted to repent and to be reconciled. Jesus interpreted Moses' words as a commendation never to stop offering repentance and reconciliation. And even more, Jesus himself was the way that God was making for the rebellious to return to relationship with God and to be reestablished as those who walk in God's way. In Deuteronomy, it was unclear how God would deal with the sin of the rebellious who wished to return. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was declaring himself as the way back. And for that reason, he had to go to the sinners to offer them himself as their way back to God. What does this event in the life of Jesus tell us about God? First, we see in the person of Jesus that God's desire is that those living in rebellious sin leave their lives of sin and return to relationship to God. God is so sincere in that desire that he took on human flesh to be the way back and to make the offer of reconciliation personally. Levi accepted God's offer through Jesus and became one of Jesus' disciples. The Gospels also tell us that many who were living in rebellion also accepted Jesus' offer. Many of us, too, can count ourselves in their number. Second, the covenant of Sinai remains a reliable source of moral and ethical direction from God. Jesus agreed with the Pharisees' conclusion that the people with whom he was eating were sinners. Even more, Jesus agreed that, as evidenced by their lifestyles, they were not at that time in right relationship with God. In Jesus' words, they were in need of repentance. As Jesus said on another occasion, preserved for us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Third, the call of God to be a holy people, a people called out of the world, is not accomplished by isolating ourselves from those who are living in rebellion against God. As Paul has warned us, we are not to indicate to those living in sin that their sin is irrelevant or that we are accepting of sin or willing to participate in it. Paul says that we are not to share table fellowship with those who are in rebellion against God and at the same time unwilling to repent and then to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. However, we must at the same time continue to extend God's offer of repentance and reconciliation to those who are in rebellion. And to do that, we must be willing to accept their invitation to dine, and we must be willing to go to where they are. The Pharisees were concerned that rebelliousness could be contagious, and that God might diagnose them as sinners simply by their proximity to rebels. There are many instances recorded in the First Testament that could appear to justify that concern but Jesus settles any fears we might have in this regard. If we are eating and fellowshipping with those living in sin because we approve of their lifestyles and choices, then we may be complicit in their wickedness. However, if we are eating and fellowshipping, as Jesus did, with the intention of calling them to repentance, then Jesus has assured us that God will view that behavior as righteous. May those who have ears to hear Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen.